Welcome to Roots and Ruminants, your podcast for creative and innovative use of farm, pasture, and rangeland. We're going back to the basics of raising and grazing livestock, growing your own forage, and practical land use. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We're at it again. Another episode of Roots and Ruminants podcast coming at you. It's Jared and I sitting down on an awesome uh, September day. Feeling like fall, got some harvest going on, still have some cover crops being planted. People are uh, excited to wean calves, getting cows out on stocks. Fall's a great time of year. Loving it. It is. It is. So that brings up uh, one of the questions I think I've gotten like a couple, probably twice yesterday. Once at the Rusty Nail last night, about nine o'clock at night when I was finishing up supper, uh, was like, is it too late to plant rye? And I was like, yeah. Justin, is it too late? It, today is the know. 26th of September. Is it too late to plant rye? I don't know if it's ever too late to plant rye. So it's definitely not too late in September to plant rye. I guess, here, I mean, if you can get rye in the ground, you can plant rye and it's still going to be there in the spring. And like, obviously you say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but really it's going to be there in the spring. Even if it uh, doesn't get out of the ground in the fall, it's going to be there in the spring. They say that a winter annual just needs to uh, swell the seed. You know, if it breaks that germ, it will go through that fertilization process and then act normal. It'll grow up, you know, in a reproductive state. If you planted rye in the spring and it never went through a cold cycle, then it's just going to stay vegetative. Or, you know, if you did that with winter wheat or something, it's just stay vegetative. But, you know, even if uh, I've seen folks plant it early in the spring, you know, like you get it out there in March and we might still have a cold snap there, it could still fertilize then. And still, really? and still act right. So yeah, it's definitely not too late. Uh, unless, you know, like if your goal is to get fall grazing, um, you might get a little bit now, but probably not. You probably yeah. should have that in by, you know, uh, like Labor Day or so. But I, I mean, I really, I caution people on really expectations of fall grazing out of rye this far north anyway. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yep. It's, it's like a nice little bonus to be with corn stalks or something. But as far as planting it into beans double or something like that and relying on just the rye growth to come up as a yeah. as a grazing mechanism. I mean, if you really early, maybe. But otherwise, you know, it's just it's a it's a kind of a spring target. You'll get oh, for sure. great grazing, but it's just not going to be a lot of volume. Yeah. Yeah. We were able no, to I agree. flush our you. I mean, so that being said, even though it's not a lot. Two times in the last four years, we've flushed our our use, flushed our use on um, on rye grazing. So again, not a lot of volume, but really, really potent. And this last year we did it. I can't remember what we had, but like this is like in a group of like Western, you know, and kind of hemp crossed use, wool use. So nothing overly prolific. Um, and I think we had like a two hundred and seventy percent lamb drop or something. Like we had a set of crazy high. two sets of live quads. Like it was <laughs> more triplets and singles, you know, it's too many lambs. Yeah. It was too many lambs. But anyway, so anyway, if you're looking for another use of rye, uh, not a lot of volume in the fall. Very, very potent. Yeah. Super high protein, really digestible. Just those leaves. Is, yeah. Beautiful. So um, anyway, September 26th, looking forward. I think we have a solid month of being able to plant rye. This Northern forecast Northern. is unbelievable right now for the upper Midwest. I mean, it's going to get to the 80s again this weekend. A lot of South Dakota got some rain. And so, boy, those people that plant the stuff, even if you planted something early September, some brassicas and that, you're going to get some good growth. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you get three awesome. inches of rain. And they're talking about basically highs of upper 70s, early, you know, low 80s in the next 10 days. Jeepers, creepers. It's going to be lights out. Yeah. We planted some cover crop. Uh, a week, uh, about, uh, yeah, I'll right out a week ago from this weekend, thinking, holy buckets, we got uh, two-inch rain coming in about seven days. We're going to punch us in the ground, and we're going to get it up and going. But we caught about five hundredths Saturday it's, night. It's, <laughs> and I think it's, it's I don't know if it's going to live or not, but it's, yeah, it's just a super dry little pocket right there. Can't seem to catch one in southwest Minnesota. That's it won't. It, the, the systems just won't get across the border. The Border oh. Patrol just locks them down, not letting yeah. them over. I just kept kind of running through because I was telling somebody, like, oh, we got a three inch rain. But that's not true. We got 12 rains that added up to three inches. Like, it's like every three four hours, it would just like rain another quarter inch, half inch, and just soaked in. Beautiful, nice. What we ought to do is start seeding more clouds our way. 
You guys probably have plenty of clouds being seeded. There's no, there's we haven't had that happen for a while. Renewable or Melbourne sell cloud seeds? We need to do that. Sell cloud seeds with your cover crops? Yeah. That's funny. Uh, probably has something to do with your government versus our government, actually. So oh, thanks. You can thank Christy for that. And yeah. I'm not going to thank my governor for that. For Minnesota. Another yeah, news, policy. another breaking news here. I've got a market report uh, from uh, sold some open heifers. Sold some open heifers here at the sale barn. And uh, I think they're worth some money out here. Worth a little money. Yeah. Yep. A little money. So 952 pounds. And this this is a Magnus livestock market here in Huron, South Dakota, east side of town. A 952 pound heifers, 239 a pound. It's twenty two hundred and seventy five dollars a head. So pretty good. What? Pretty good. How much did they weigh? Nine hundred fifty two pounds. Open hammer. Wow. Coming off grass. How, what were breads bringing last year? Wasn't it right around that? <laughs> well, I think you could have probably laid in some breads as late as first of March. Common, you know, common like bread black sixty day stuff. Yeah. 1850, yeah. 1850, 1900 at most, you know, for good ones. Now a 900 pound open heifer is bringing $300 more. Yeah. Love it. It's great. These heifers probably would have been legit worth on the market 1700 the first of April. You know what I mean? Like by the time we would have gone to grass, they were up a lot. But if you would have, you know, got them in 30 days ahead of time, 45 days ahead of time. So for anybody out there that has a, uh, did unhedged yearlings on grass this year. Congrats. Good move. Good move. Good move. You ro rolled that up. Could have been, could have been here on here on here and here on. That should be the new tagline. Here here and here on. When you said, yeah, we sold them at Magnus Livestock here and here on. I could uh if you're in here and here on like the locals is urine. Urine. Urine here and urine. Sounds like a year. I don't know why. Are there still two barns in here on? Yeah, there is kind of. Yeah, the West one's not as um, it's not as active as it used to be. But yes, definitely both having sales. Yep, that's the market report from the from the week. Market report's good. Um, uh, one one rye thing that we didn't talk about when we we're talking about rye time is hybrid rye. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So tell me more about hybrid rye. Justin. I'm going to tell you more about hybrid rye. Uh, have you heard about this performer in this Kasani? I, you would tell me about like some of oh. these, but I haven't like I don't know the varieties well enough yet to like give details on them. So okay, so we started carrying these at Melbourne Seeds here. We started carrying Performer and Kasani this year, um, and really because they started just kicking butt in all these yield trials in the area, and um, so we uh, we're actually they're 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 Canadian based company called Satin Union is the breeder behind them. And so they probably fit uh, really, really well with our upper Midwest climate. So Satin winter harvest sounds is, like a band. Satin sounds like a train a station or like a... Welcome. Welcome to the stage. Satin Union. It's a good one. It could be a band yeah. name. That's right. I had a buddy who always wanted to name a band Leafy Spurge. He thought that was the best band name ever. <laughs> Leafy Spurge. I'm like, I don't know about that. But Performer and Kasani... Yeah. Um, yeah, have a lot of confidence in them. Okay, so we talk about timing of planting rye. The hybrid rye, obviously, that too, we want that to stool as much as possible. So we'll probably shut that off for a planting date around the, you know, that first part of October. Mm -hmm. We get much past that. You know, if you don't get any fall growth on that, you're really going to limit the amount of stooling that you can get. And obviously, tillers make yield as far as more seed heads and that. So, uh, but those hybrid rye varieties, like, uh, in some of those Minnesota trials, I mean, they're yielding close to 150 bushel. Absolutely nuts for bushel? rye. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy good. We usually say, you know, you can plan on like 80 to 100 bushel per acre yeah. off of this hybrid rye compared to, you know, your open pollinated yeah. varieties like Ryman and Hazlitt. They'll be 40 to 60 always, yeah. all the time, real consistent. Yeah. But, so, yeah, we're happy about those. That's that's wild. How many how many uh, bottles of whiskey do you get per bushel of rye? What's the um, whiskey to bushels? <laughs> Maybe like a half a shooter. <laughs> really? What do you like? Really, what do you think it is? I, I mean, it know. can't be much. It can't be much. A bushel of rye. Yeah. Well, but it probably got to be a couple bottles because I mean, if you like make it, what you're paying for is quality. But like, you think about like the the real cheap fifteen dollar one seven five handles. You know what I mean? 
Like you can't buy a lot of rye for 15 bucks. That's true. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, from a volume standpoint, no, I'm sure that to get it to quality, it takes a lot more in marketing and stuff. So I don't know. It has to be a couple. Oh, hey, let's. Okay. Sorry. Back this up. Uh, it's got to be pretty similar to ethanol yields, which I believe for like a, a, a dry mill ethanol plant, like 2.6 to 2.7 gallons of ethanol per bushel. So it's got to be pretty similar to that. You know, starch content's a little lower. So you think you could get two and a half gallons? Yeah, I'd say like yeah. I'd say, let's just say rye two. whiskey per bushel. Let's just say two. Two gallons of rye whiskey per. Yeah. Wow. Well, actually, probably more because that would be ethanol, which is like distilled down to Everclear levels. Oh, that's so true. If you have like a forty proof, you know, or eighty proof whiskey, it's forty percent. You just have that much more water, so technically, it should be more. Okay, but let's just say it's at least two. two yeah, to, two to five. I was thinking exactly opposite of that, actually. I thought it'd be just a tiny little bit like less. Yeah. Yeah. That's more. Okay. So two gallons two, of rye whiskey per bushel. Of rye. It's like 300 gallons of whiskey per acre on the hybrid stuff. Man, you're, you're so quick at math. So we should do, if we do a promo, can we get, can Renovo buy 300 gallons of whiskey? We'll ask Shannon about this and Laura. We can I get think 300 deal. gallons of whiskey and set it in front of. A field trial. <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> I'm, okay, we're going to think of a tagline for that. 300 gallons of Templeton rye. Yes. Yes. Is Maker's for, Mark rye as well? I think it, is. it might be, right? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't think so. Templeton for sure. Templeton. So Templeton. Yeah. Doers. That's Canadian. Doers. Probably better not promote Canadian. Whiskey, rye whiskey. Probably should promote American rye whiskey if we're doing this in America. Yeah. Yep. We should do a giveaway. Like for every, like for every acre of hybrid rye, you put your name in a hat. If you win, you get three hundred gallons. Of <laughs> <laughs> that's like it's a detri- That's like a de- detrimental amount of whiskey to your life. Like there's no situation where like that's that's like was good for you that you won that. That's too much <laughs> for anybody. You have gifts for the rest of your life to give to people. <laughs> right. Right. Or, yeah. We actually are giving away whiskey glasses. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, when people yeah, buy uh, our rye cocktail that. mixes online. Tell us about that. Yeah. That well, fun. if you buy, I just did. Okay. Well, did you know that if you oh, buy a rye cocktail anyway. blend on our e commerce site, you get a whiskey glass? Oh. Yep. Nice. What's the, what's the whiskey glass say? I think it says, you know what? Give me one second. Yeah, you go find that. I'll no, I have it right next to me. Oh, you realize? <laughs> yeah, right, literally there. right next to me. This this sounds like we made this, like planned this. We yeah, I don't know. Plan this at all. <laughs> I just happened to have. It. I actually haven't even seen one of these. Oh, all right, it's, it's like a big good. unveiling. Is there a minimum? Oh, nice. Let's look sharp. Yeah, let's look really Renewable sharp. Noble seeds, whiskey glass. Buy your huh. rock, rye cocktails on our e-commerce oh, site today. What's the minimum order you have to buy? Yeah, um, there is one. There is? Okay. I want to say it's um, maybe like 300 pounds. Okay. Which isn't much. Not, not much. No. Do a few no, acres. Not much. Yeah. It's like six well, acres worth of rye cocktails. And you get a, a glass or a glass set? A glass? Glass. One glass. So you have to put four orders in if you wanted a set. Yeah, you have to put four separate orders in and different family members' names. That's exactly how I do it. Yes, but I bet if you put them all in the same day <laughs> and put the same address, you could get like the same. Like someone would catch it, like Dallas or somebody would catch it back there and be like, "Oh, these are all going to the same place. Let's put it all in one LTO, right?" Hopefully, yeah, yeah, that would be that'd be great. You could save on shipping. If somebody does that, they deserve to get four. If glasses. you email in an e-commerce and you have a promo code that you buy, you know, and you're you know, willing to do that four times the minimum order and say that you heard about it on Ritz and Ruminants, we probably could make something work, right? I think that's, yes. Yep. Fair We're going to make that happen. Fair enough. Um, unveiling. So we just unveiled those glasses. But remember when we were at that art show this weekend? <laughs> For the unveiling? Did you just go to one? We <laughs> went to one. several. No. <laughs> it, was so, it was fun. It was really cool to go to a, an art unveiling. Yeah, Jared and I were at it. Yeah, it was we really to... passionate about what she does and who she is and 
everything. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But I can't say I do that very often. Like, go to small towns, art galleries. Yeah. This is the first art show I've ever been to. Yeah. And it was in Lake Benton, Minnesota. Went to Michelle Weber's studio in Lake Benton. It's fantastic. Which is one of the only. It's one of the only art galleries in Lake Benton, right? I mean, there's only a couple. That's the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the only one for a long ways in any direction. I had a chuckle. I, so it was absolutely like beautiful, right? Like, yeah, she's an amazing artist. Paintings yeah. are absolutely fantastic. She actually painted for us down at Commodity Classic last year too. So she had those up and display. But I had a chuckle when 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 they did the unveiling. You know, it's just a bunch of Midwesterners yeah. sipping on box wine, yeah. visiting about harvest, and then we get this unveiling, and everybody's like, "Oh, cool! Yeah, it looked really yeah. great." I, and they're like fantastic, but I know. we just really don't know how to act in that setting. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what to do. No, uh, no, it was, it was awesome. Couldn't be happier for Michelle. And uh, so she's got what eight or nine different other artists that do different things from artisan bakery to pottery to, you know, jewelry making. Everything is homemade. None of it's kind of your more typical, like, I don't want to say pyramids, but like peer to peer marketing. <laughs> like it's all homemade stuff, right? Let's yeah. be honest. Like it's not someone like trying to like get into a, uh, Tupperware pyramid scheme or anything like that. And uh, eight or nine art. So she's created this like venue for all these local, local artists, right. That are all kind of mm -hmm. doing things based around, you know, primarily obviously the big draw is her, her paintings and, and what she's been able to accomplish in her fan base and her, um, you know, customer base. But like the, as you walk through that building, there was always different like tables and stops and, and little displays where other, other folks were, bringing their wares in too. So it was really cool. Like it was building yeah. a community around really high end artisan type artwork, artisan mm -hmm. artwork. But anyway, it was, uh, it was really neat. It was very, very happy for, for Michelle and the family. And it was cool. It was cool. How many, how many Weber, how many original, how many original Michelle Weber, uh, oil canvases and how many prints do you have in your house, Justin? Oh boy. <laughs> So we, I think we have quite yes. a few. Um, I want to say probably four. Four originals or four prints? Uh, one, two, two originals, and then I think two prints. Yeah. I think we're about mm -hmm. the same. I think we have two originals and a couple of prints. Of course, it's not behind me. That's not it. That's it. That's not it. Oh, one, dang it. But um, yeah, like we were kind of, we were looking through the, the different prints and selections and stuff. We're like, oh, we have... The kids were like, we have this in our house. It's like, yeah, yeah. same one. Do? And then that one um, with the, I also feel kind of privileged because the one Katahdin painting that she does have in prints available, Mother's Love, is actually our Katahdin's, not your Katahdin's. What? Yeah. That picture, that, the, that Katahdin with the two lambs called a Mother's Love or a Mother something. Do you see that one? I, yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm hurt right now. I don't even... Yeah, I know. I know it's I kind of an honor. That. And Michelle, met, <laughs> anyway, when she did it, she's like, "I have always wanted to do a Katahdin painting, but I just did not want to do stuff. <laughs> just did not want to do sturdy." No, she didn't say that. It was like a picture that Katie took on her cell phone one day doing chores at the old place because you can tell it's got the galvanized tin in the background. Anyway, yeah, cool. all everyone listening should check out michellewebberstudios.com. I'm not sure what the website is. But just Google. I don't it. either. I bet Google, Google Michelle Weber Lake Benton Studio, and. She's got an amazing selection of prints and, and cards and stuff. And she'll also do custom stuff. So let's go back to like what she did at Commodity Classic because it was really quite amazing. So we had her come down. She did three paintings in three days, like a painting a day. So she would start with a blank canvas. And she had a pretty good idea, I think, what she wanted to paint on. I mean, I'm sure she had ideas and kind of maybe a drawing. And then she would completely finish this painting in one day in front of everybody. And people would walk by. Like, it was a huge draw to the booth. People would come back multiple times a day to see the progression because they'd, you know, walk by at 10 o'clock in the morning and then want to see it again at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and then again at 4.30 yeah. when it was done. And people would stop, ask her questions, like, talk, like, interrupt her painting. They'd like, to just like, hey, like, what, what are you thinking here? What is this? And, kind of, and she was very gracious and calm about the whole deal. But, like, I can't Im imagine, like, like, I'm trying to paint here. And I told these people, I'm going to have it done. Like, the trade show ends at 5. I have to be done at 5. But she was so, like, nice and calm about it. I did a yeah. great job. And so then, oh when part gosh, of the yeah. unveiling, like, all three of the paintings are up there as a series. And you got thinking about that. It was like, it's kind of amazing that in one day, you can sit down and do something that's actually, like, worth looking at again. That's you know, true. I know it's, like, okay, but it's actually really done well.
I think she touched him up a little bit afterwards, but yeah, it was fun. Yeah. It was fun to be a part of it. Um, yeah. Very and cool have thing. like several different ways that Melbourne over the years has been able to, you know, kind of support her. And it was cool. It was a proud moment. You bet. For small town America and her. And, yeah. It's neat. That's true. Yeah. Hey, we talk about that a lot, right? Agriculture and the communities and living through it. And so it's good. She also has books. So check out her book series too. Children's very, books. Very good. Yeah. Children's books on real, like not your typical anthropomorphic false narrative around, you know, agriculture, but like real um, farm kid experiences that would be relatable mm -hmm. to people that live on farms and also that don't. So mm -hmm. she does a good job. Yeah. All right. So we got, we got the rye report done. We got the market yep. report done. We've got our, our weekend art gallery update. That's right. We're doing pretty good on our schedule. Yeah, well, it's time for, you know what time, you know what we need? We need like one of those jingles and we go, it's time for graze it, harvest it, rent it out. Don't we need one of those? We do need one of those. Yeah, we should have okay. someone do one of those. Yeah. Maybe we should have a, Can you still like get a singer or a musical instrument player do that? Okay. A musician. Do you know a musician? Yeah. Katie teaches music at Will Lake School. There we go. Maybe we can have her do a little grader. jingle. The third graders. Is like they're three weeks into music. They're in the third grade. They should be able to know how to do a professional jingle at this point. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk to her about having one of her elementary classes do a jingle. Perfect. For us. All right. Stay tuned for next episode with, with recorders. The jingle. Okay. Recorders. Do you want to play? We had this. We had this one sent in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we had this sent in from one of our good friends, David Larson. So is that Donnelly, the same, Minnesota? The same David Larson. Then? That's is that the same? that's the one. You know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is a good graze it, harvest it, rent it. It's simple, but it makes you think. There's a lot of opportunity with this one. So you have to like choose the best opportunity. Okay. So each field is 160 acres. Okay, field one, 160 acres of PP on June 1st. Okay. Field two, 160 acres of corn stalks on November 1st. Okay. Field three, 160 acres of wheat stubble on August 1st. Okay. Yeah. I Okay, so I'm going to rent. It, harvest it, rent it out. Yep. I'm going to rent my corn stalks. Okay. Right? Lots of cows in my area. Anytime you have corn stalks, you can rent it. I, this is like a fun debate and for all, all of our listeners outside of our world i think we've talked about corn stock grazing and how in the northern plains in the midwest for the most part we are a per acre based payment instead yeah. of a per head per day and i know some people complain about that because like you pay so much per per acre and it's like well what if you get snowed out or whatever you usually come to an agreement like ah, i was only out there 10 days i had to get off um low, lower the rent or something right but it's way cheaper to do it per acre than it is per head per day because 15 is like break net $15 an acre is like breakneck stupid high corn stock, you know, renting rates. Right. So how much so can you rent it per acre for? But I'd take 10 bucks. I'd be like, Hey, 10 you bucks. take 10 bucks. Okay. I think so. I think it's fair. Right. Cause if okay. you should get a month, you should, I mean, should you get a, you should best first of November, first of November, you should be solid to the first of December for the most part. You should get a month per head on corn stocks. And at ten bucks, it's like thirty cents a day. You know, a TMR in a dry lot is going to be two and a half, two thirty yeah. minimum. So you're saving yeah. two bucks. A day. So I'm going to take the I'm going to take the rent on that. Okay, you are cashing in your sixteen hundred bucks. Yep, and then I'm going to use that sixteen hundred dollars to invest in seed that's going to go on my other my graze it opportunity, which is going to be the after wheat. Which did you say August first? Do we get to start in the August first? Yeah, that's nice. That's generous. Perfect. If we would have got it in August first this year, we would have got that nice two inch rain on it, which would have been true. like everything primed and ready to go for the three inch rain, which was our next rain <laughs> six weeks later, seven weeks later. <laughs> but everything would have been primed and ready to go, and we'd be like lights out right now. So then in two weeks we could wean calves, like we're going to, and then go straight dry up the cows first for a week or two, because I don't think that's the thing you want to do either. You don't want to go straight like wean the calves pull the cows off of the wet cows and then go right onto a super lush high protein diet either. Cause I think you, you know, you got to dry them up first, yeah. right? Yeah. Dry them up, go to cover crop. And then, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to bail, bail chop, 
some some combination of that June one June one prevent plant. That's a great opportunity to make feed. Yeah, I agree. That's my. What do you think? I yeah, I think I'd probably do it similar to. I was thinking that probably gives you the most upside for. I mean, what you can potentially produce. It's something planting June first, man. You got a lot of options with sorghum sedan grass or Japanese millet or something. I mean, you can put up a lot of feed if it's June first and. Yep. The rules are pretty wide open now as far as harvesting on PP acres. So mm-hmm. let her rip with some sorghum sedan grass, probably, you know, put up 12 ton of silage off of that or something, or put up, you know, three to four ton of Japanese millet hay and maybe get a little regrowth to graze in the fall too. Mm-hmm. Definitely a huge opportunity there. Yeah, the wheat stubble, I like that August 1st. I, yeah, you come in there with some brassicas, plant some turnips, rapeseed. Radish. Yeah, if I would do that, I would do a, a customized, you know, like yeah, you know, ranch hands. You want something like that, but I would go in and probably upgrade almost everything. I mean, you've already got the grass or radish in in ranch hand already, but I would probably upgrade the rest of the brassicas up quite a bit. You know, maybe do you know some more like pearl millet type BMR, you know, stuff um, on the sorghums instead of just straight sorghum sedan because you've got so much time there. I mean, I'm really bullish in that yeah. first August. That first August planting for me is a sweet yeah. spot, especially if it's close to home. How big would that be right now? Uh, if it would have made it for that first rain, yeah, I would say it would be probably 16 to 24 inches tall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it would have got planted two weeks later, it might, it probably would have germinated, but not much. I mean, yeah, it'd just be a few inches high. Whatever first I calf efforts, get them out on the cover crop. Yeah, we do talk about that. Like, what's your most. What's your biggest value piece of livestock that you can graze on the cover crop? Because that is going to be your best quality feed in the fall, no matter what. And that, yeah. boy, if, if you've got, yeah, you, or even bread heifers, you know, that you want to just flush up a little bit. Um, great opportunity for them. I've seen people do it with weaned calves. You know, that that's fantastic if you have fence. But that's usually the limitation yeah. there is it's, if it's going on a crop field, maybe you're just running a single hot wire and your calves are a little small. And this time of year, the stinking calves are used to duck in hot wires if you run hot wire. Like they're just little boogers right now. So yeah, usually it's easier to wean them and start feeding them than it is to keep fencing. Cool. But if you get a bigger lot there, what's your thoughts on on getting a cover crop established in your lots? You know, it's been kind of oh, man. Up over here. We sell, you know, a few bags here and there to guys like, hey, get the lots shaped up early. Haul some yeah. or midsummer on some wheat ground or whatever, or at least just pile it up and then get something planted. And I think everybody started doing that just by keeping the dust down and stuff. But yeah, like we we wean on quite big lots, honestly. Yeah. And I think that there is a definite value to having some transition to the bunk of a green, living, growing forage of some sort because that's what they're they're used to. For sure, it is. So I would definitely do that. I mean, that people will do sorghum sedan grass, millet, oats, anything, anything that's going to be green and they're used to munching on. It's going to hold your dust down too, which is probably one of its biggest benefits. Yeah. But that too, you know, I mean, even if I mean, we've had years where we don't get something out, and you're going to just get pigeon grass, and you get some kosher coming. They're still going to munch at the pigeon grass because that's what they're used right. to eating before they get to the bunk. And so yeah. having something there is that's a nice transition. You know what yeah. we should do. What's Anytime up? somebody sends in a graze it, harvest it, rent it out scenario, we put them in the drawing for 300 gallons of rye whiskey. <laughs> and we don't have to like pick a date on when we're going to give the 300 gallons away. It could be very, <laughs> very far away in the future. It's like, in, in, you know, it's indefinite time frame. Yeah, you're still in the drawing. Forward. Yeah. The drawing hasn't happened point. yet. You're, you're still in the drawing. Right. It, it, it prob- yeah. It's not going to be this year. It, pro- it won't be next year. You know, it could be somewhere in the five to 10 years from now. We're Maybe we it. shouldn't have said that part. So thanks, David, for sending that in. You are in the drawing for 300 gallons of rye whiskey. <laughs> I, I'm writing your name down now. So that's just one more incentive to send in your roots and ruminants, um, graze it, harvest it, rent it scenarios. Send it into our new email address to get in the drawing. We'll Must give be you a 21 shower. or older now uh, <laughs> to listen to the podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining in, everybody, for our little update. Uh, we'll be back uh, with some guests here next week or two. And uh, that's right. Good luck, everybody, this harvest this fall. And we'll be catching up with you soon. All righty. See ya.